I'm Larry, by the way. Uh, that's Isaac. And it's, it's worth saying that we both arrived in the same year, in 1972, and we've been friends ever since. And so we could write a book together. Uh, thank you for being here. When Isaac and I spoke at Buffalo Street Books a couple of weeks ago, it was a beautiful day. Uh, less beautiful today, so um, you have no excuse except to come in and listen. Um, I'm going to uh, talk generally about several aspects of the book and then turn it over to Isaac. I'm not reading from the book, but if you do read the book yourself, you will find the material I'm going to cover familiar enough. Early in the 1890s and continuing through the 19th century, Small groups of urban free thinkers began a tradition of meeting on January the 29th each year to celebrate the birthday of, anyone know? Thomas Paine. Uh, Thomas Paine's pamphlet, Common Sense, which was published early in 1776 and came out before the Declaration of Independence, did as much as any written document to spark the American Revolution. It became a bestseller. Paine became an American patriot and hero. He wrote other things. But when he died in 1809, that reputation had passed. He was no longer a popular hero. His reputation had plummeted. He was vilified in the American press. What had happened to him was that he had gone to France, where he participated in a more complicated revolutionary situation, which was vehemently anti-clerical. Uh, he actually spent some time in prison under the Reign of Terror, and it was during that time that he wrote another book, The Age of Reason, which was a celebration of the claims of reason over the claims of uh, revealed religion laid down in the Bible. And it was sarcastic, it's funny, it's, uh, it, it is right in your face of anyone who uh, held scripture to be something sacred. Religious leaders in the United States, as soon as the book was published, conflated the common sense deism of pain that he had used to unmask the tyranny of biblical scripture, which was the same common sense which he had used to unmask the uh, worthlessness of the crowned ruffians, as he put it, of Europe. Uh, they conflated his deism into atheism. It was the same thing. It was against religion. Pain of course, did believe in a designer God who gave human beings the reason necessary to understand his creation. But he was a sort of absentee God, after all, who didn't certainly demand prayer or worship services. The clerical campaign against him was long, it was determined, and it was successful. Pain uh, and his atheism became a term of opprobrium, opprobrium in 19th century America. The 19th century free thinkers who gathered to celebrate his birthday were a minority. They knew they were a minority. They included people who ran afoul of blasphemy laws in the 19th century. Their disparaged place in American culture is, I suppose, the basic reason that Isaac and I wrote this book. Because we still hear that claim that to be an atheist is somehow un-American. It's embedded in our political rhetoric it's embedded in our political speech. Polls about potential presidential candidates who don't believe in God aren't very encouraging to such candidates. Over 50% of people in both political parties say they would not vote for a well-qualified candidate put up by their party if that, party if that person did not believe in God. So to declare one's non-belief is a non-starter almost for any kind of conceivable election that you could run for in many parts of the country. And I want to just go back into history because there is a historical portion of the book, the first half of it, uh, to pick on a few examples as show you how far this uh, bias goes. And I'm going to talk about two people. Robert Ingersoll, who is a name that may or may not be known to you, uh, certainly known to historians, but maybe not anyone else. Uh, the other name is more familiar, that is Elizabeth Cady Stanton, because she is familiar, I think, virtually to everyone because of her pioneering role in the women's rights movement, but not perhaps because of what she viewed 
as her most important work, which came out in the last decade of her life, she authored the two volumes of the woman's Bible. Start with Ingersoll. Who demonstrates how in a short time you can go from being a household name across the country to a forgotten person. As a young man, he was an extremely talented and ambitious political aspirant who many thought was headed for high office. A eulogy in the Washington Post written when he died in 1899, and this was echoed in major newspapers across the country, with his splendid gifts of oratory, his magnetic manners, his genial humor, there was no position of honor to which he might have aspired with an almost certainty of success, but for his agnosticism. Ingersoll developed doubts about God's existence at almost the same time he set out after he had served in the Civil War with distinction to seek political office where he then lived in Illinois. He could have done what many other politicians surely did do and do now, follow the advice of your friends, shut up about your religious views, go to church, and make sure people see you going to church. Instead, he reportedly told Illinois Republican Party leaders, my religious position I would not, under any circumstances, not even for my life, renounce. I would rather be, refuse to be President of the United States than to do so. And he publicly embraced, then, the label agnostic, which had been coined by Thomas Henry Huxley, uh, the English naturalist who was famous at the time for his championing of Darwin's evolutionary views, which were under attack even then. He was Darwin's bulldog. Ingersoll began to publish articles against religion that Paine would have relished, and he admired Paine. Some of his articles were, in fact, about Paine. But even then, the political fallout wasn't entirely clear. Ingersoll was picked to nominate for the presidency in 1876 at the Republican convention, James G. Blaine, the sen senator from Maine, from that state, and a viable candidate. And in a fiery speech, Ingersoll dubbed Blaine the plumed knight, uh, which was a famous speech. Still useful for students to know that if they're taking AP American history. Uh, it was a speech that made headlines. It was uh, billed as the most sensational speech of the convention, even though the nomination did not go to Blaine, but to Rutherford B. Hayes, who prevailed in a contested general election that was settled in the House of Representatives. Uh, Hayes called upon Ingersoll once he was nominated to campaign for him, and Ingersoll did that, he was, uh, that Hayes was grateful, and he tried to make Ingersoll the ambassador to Germany. That was turned back, and as the New York Times said, the suggestion that a declared and boasting unbeliever should be chosen to represent a Christian country brought a storm of indignation. Ingersoll continued on and off throughout the rest of his life to campaign for Republican candidates, but he had a more successful career. Well, he was a lawyer too, but as a lecturer appearing in every state except Mississippi, North Carolina, and Oklahoma states at the time, filling the biggest auditoriums, attacking Christianity, attacking the Bible, and with great relish, attacking the clergy. Uh, public oratory was then a form of entertainment. Uh, you know, People wandered the country uh, giving speeches, and Ingersoll was the most famous of all of them, despite his subject. He was humorous, he was good-natured. Uh, people went to hear him attack religion because they liked to argue about religion. Uh, that he said, to prevent the growth of the human mind, that is blasphemy. To pollute children's minds with the dogma of eternal punishment to excite the prejudice of ignorance and superstition, that is blasphemy. Audience heard that, even though they wouldn't vote for him in the end. Ingersoll was basically a conservative, a man who loved his country, a patriot, and I stress this because atheism in the 19th century was often tied to political radicalism and then attacked, especially to anarchism, a foreign import. A linkage that continued into the 20th century and proved very useful during the Cold War, which is something Isaac 
we'll talk about a little bit later. I just want to say that Ingersoll was a great orator who could make complex issues seem simple and clear. He held the attention of a crowd better than any public figure of his time. He was a man with a great capacity for friendship and an abiding love of his wife and daughters who always attended his lectures. He was a family man with family values. He might have become president, except he didn't believe in God. But he didn't record regrets about that outcome. He just couldn't understand why Americans didn't embrace Thomas Paine's statement that any statement of any system religion of religion that has anything in it that shocks the mind of a child cannot be true. Neither could Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, who, like Ingersoll, recorded her early religious upbringing uh, with great uh, sorrow. <laughs> That's the only word for it. So when the temperature was 20 degrees below zero, we trudged along through the snow to the cold hospitalities of the Lord's house, there to be chilled to the very core by listening to sermons on predestination and eternal damnation. Uh, Calvinism was the background, by the way, of both Stanton and Ingersoll. In fact, Ingersoll was the son of a Calvinist minister. The sermons that Stanton heard as a young woman delivered by the famous revival preacher of the early 19th century, Charles Grandison Finney, left her feeling like a monster of iniquity poised on the brink of hell. Visions of the lost haunted my dreams. But only later did Stanton begin a all-out campaign against religion and the damage she thought it did. Instead, younger, married, with children, and a lot of them, and living in Seneca Falls, New York, she organized the first Women's Rights Convention in 1848. And a few years later, she teamed with Susan Anthony, who had not been at Seneca Falls, uh, to travel together and separately across the country on speaking tours advocating women's suffrage, divorce reform, laws that secured property rights for married women. Together, they formed the first women's suffrage organization and wrote a three-volume history of women's suffrage. Both women were agnostic, but only Stanton chose to bring her complaints about religion to the fore. That happened in the last decade and a half of her career. She died in 1902 and was active to the end. Inspired by Ingersoll, who she revered. Stanton, in an article in the North American Review in 1895, said that Christianity conspired to hold women in a condition of slavery. Sacred scriptures make women an afterthought in the creation, the author of sin, and maternity a curse, a just punishment for affecting the downfall of man. These ideas did not sit well with many members of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, who were also members of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Uh, Stanton didn't care. Uh, so Susan B. Anthony did care. Uh, but the people who uh, were in the WCTU were quite numerous, uh, and they did not applaud the work that Stanton considered her most important contribution, the compiling of the publication of the Women's Bible in two volumes in 1895 and 1898. The commentaries in both volumes centered on pointing out the text that denigrated women, two volumes worth of them, beginning with the story of creation and coming down to a person she especially disliked, St. Paul. The Bible was not in her mind the word of God who didn't exist anyway. At its annual convention in 1896, the National American Women's Suffrage Association passed a resolution repudiating any official connection with the woman's Bible. It wasn't necessary because there was no official connection. Stanton had done this on her own. But they did it anyway, just to make clear, and included in the resolution this statement. The very essence of religion is equal and exact justice for all women and men. Therefore, the demand for women's suffrage is, in the largest sense, a moral and religious movement. After she died, those who wanted to honor Stanton, and they had to, chose to bury her religious doubts along with the women's Bible. 
which is very hard to get copies of uh, these days. Her name, in fact, was rarely invoked in the last stages of the suffrage movement in this country. In 1923, with suffrage safely won, Alice Paul introduced the never ratify Equal Rights Amendment before the National Women's Party. She praised Anthony, but said not one word about Stanton, the woman who had made Seneca Falls famous and who predicted correctly that the vote by itself would not make women the equal of men. The lesson that Isaac and I take from this, and I think we all can, is that if you want to be revered in American history, uh, you don't mix your work with an insistence that Christianity is a foolish set of superstitions that cripple the progress of reason and science. <laughs> but in fact, a lot of damage flows from that attitude, and which is again one of the points of the book. Consider this closely related point. Textbooks of American history are filled with examples of how religion shaped our country. Puritans did what they did because they were religious. Mormons would never have survived persecution and reached the Great Salt Lake without their faith. Slave religion proved an essential way for African American slaves in the antebellum South to define their humanity and to resist. And for free blacks in the North, relying on their own independent black churches to build resistance against discrimination. Catholicism provided the means for many immigrants to adopt their lives they had led, to adapt the lives they had left in Europe to new circumstances in the United States. It was the center of community. And that's fine and it's true. But what we need to challenge is the habit of saying nothing about the importance of non-belief and why it was important to many people who also helped to build this country, starting, say, with Thomas Edison. Uh, and coming to Albert Einstein. My, my favorite example is Luther Burbank, because so many schools are named for him. Without the children who attending those schools ever learning that he was an ardent admirer of Paine and Ingersoll. He was 77 when he wrote an article that declared, I am an infidel. His decision to announce publicly views he had long held was prompted by the dismay he felt over the so-called Scopes-Darwin trial of 1925 that in a famous courtroom uh, cross-examination, the religious fundamentalist William Jennings Bryan submitted to the questions of the agnostic Clarence Darrow. When John Scopes was convicted, because he was convicted, for illegally teaching evolution to the children of Dayton, Tennessee, Burbank wrote in exasperation, and to think of this great country in danger of being dominated by people ignorant enough to take a few ancient Babylonian legends as the canons of modern culture. Burbank was ashamed that he had been afraid to speak out earlier, thinking that unwillingness to talk about non-belief as important uh, was something he should not have ducked. He managed to survive in his reputation, though he received a lot of hate mail after the publication of I Am a Infidel. And as I say, he's honored, many schools are named for him. But the children there, and this is the point, might learn that the russet Burbank potato is the most widely cultivated potato in the United States and is used by family-friendly McDonald's to make its french fries. But they are not asked to read or hear about I Am an Infidel. The cultural bias making non-belief a reproach, just not to mention it, badly needs revision. We need to celebrate people who link their ability to make creative leaps outside the box of received thought to their agnosticism, when in fact they do. To say nothing about non-belief as a position often linked to scientific innovation is akin to saying that the Massachusetts Bay Puritans like to work hard, just for the hell of it, without mentioning their belief that steady work in their calling was a sign that they were among the saints God had elected for salvation. Cultural science, silence about non-belief in these associations, I think, Isaac thinks, still link to biases we have against scientific research that bedevil public policy decisions and allow even presidents to ignore opinions of scientists about things like climate change. I want to mention uh, just very briefly a Cornell graduate, Jeffrey Hawkins, who graduated in 1979 with a degree in electrical engineering. 
He made an early fortune with the invention of the Palm Pilot and has recently been singled out in an article last week by the New York Times as a maverick in the fields of neuroscience and artificial intelligence. He doesn't depend upon the usual channels of scientific inquiry because he's rich enough to fund his own research in laboratories and hire his own assistants. But what caught our attention, aside from the fact that his work is considered important, is that he gives lots of money to the Secular Coalition of America, a lobbying organization composed of a federation of non-theist groups founded in 1902 by Herb Silberman, a mathematician who ran for governor of South Carolina. Pardon me? What did I say? 1902. 2002. <laughs> uh, uh, in an unsuccessful attempt to have removed from the state's constitution a provision requiring all state office holders to declare a belief in God, which is a provision twice declared unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court, but nonetheless remains in the text of the South Carolina Constitution and that of seven other states. Hawkins has also invested heavily in the Secular Student Alliance, that funds college chapters, that, as these are his words, that give our youth the confidence to promote secular causes and to, counter, and to counter the demonization of atheist and secular advocates. Uh, I don't think there is a chapter of the Secular Student Alliance at Cornell, but there is one at many colleges, including the place where Hawkins got his graduate degree, the University of California at Berkeley. The persistence of the cultural bias against non-belief is puzzling in our own day when non-believers, what pollsters call nuns, have some clout, or they would have some clout, if they bothered to organize or feel they had something in common in a way of a public voice. The trends about the growing number of so-called nuns, what pollsters use to characterize people who have no religious affiliation. They don't necessarily say I'm an atheist, but they don't belong to any religion and they don't uh, pay any attention to religion. They're nuns. Uh, their percentage of the population is now roughly 25%, which is the same percentage of the population that the evangelical conservative Protestants have in the population. Uh, but think about what you hear the most about in the press. It is the evangelical conservative Protestants as they march out to promote uh, Donald Trump as the man best able to keep America safely under God, and very little about the nuns. And I think part of our book seeks to try to give non-theists a reason to look for common purpose, to be angry at least, when political speech, ceremonial occasions, even the money in our wallets, symbolically exclude them and suggest they are second-class citizens because they don't believe in God. And it's, it's pointing out this is not about meaningless symbols. We take on that uh, formula about used by courts. These are not meaningless symbols of patriotism. They are the symbols that create a culture in which non-belief goes unrecognized as a religious point of view that has often provided the spark of innovation. So it's time to give Thomas Paine a place in the pantheon of the founders. After all, he was one of the founders who didn't own slaves and who advocated the abolition of slavery uh, as part of, you know, before he wrote The Age of Reason. The only statue of Paine, full-size statue of Paine, that exists in a national capital is not in Washington, but in the Parc Monserie in Paris. And yet no one better represented the boldness, the rudeness, if you like, of the American experiment than Paine. If we ever get him a national monument, and we think he deserves one, it should be inscribed with the words he penned in 1775. When we yield up the exclusive privilege of thinking, the last shadow of liberty quits the horizon. Paine has the last word of my part. Now it's Isaac's turn. You have to be on. It records. It's recorded. Okay. Can you hear me? I'm going to read 
a section from our book where we tell the story of the Pledge of Allegiance and its claim that America is, quote, one nation under God. I, I, I will need to edit the text somewhat should you ever read this chapter, and you'll see there's a lot in it that I'm not t reading uh, because of, the, of time constraints. Every morning in most American public schools, the day begins with students participating in a teacher-led pledge of allegiance to the flag. Americans invoke God in this nationalist ritual. Quote, I pledge, allegi I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Now, no founding father authored this pledge to sustain our young republic. Its history is of a relatively more recent vintage and alas is permeated, most people don't know, by mercantile motives. The Pledge of Allegiance was written in 1892 as part of a public relations campaign run by the respected and popular Boston-based magazine, Youth's Companion. The magazine had launched a national initiative in the late 1880s, together with the Association of Union Army Veterans, to have a flag fly over every schoolhouse in America. That's a quote. Offering sales of flags with a printed order form, the periodical campaigned in 1892 to have 13 million school children participate in that October's nat national celebration of the 400th anniversary of the so-called Discovery of America in 1492 when Columbus, as we all know, sailed the ocean blue. How better to sell flags to schools than to have the youth's companion invent a pledge to the flag that could be recited in every schoolhouse in America? The author of this pledge was one Francis Bellamy, a cousin of the famous socialist writer and activist Edward Bellamy, who had written the best-selling utopian or dystopian novel, Looking Backward, in 1889. The, pe the pledge that Francis Bellamy wrote to help sell flags in 1892 made no reference to God, in fact, no reference even to the United States. The original Pledge of Allegiance, published in Youth's Companion on September 8, 1892, was the following, quote, I pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. For, Mel for Bellamy, who was inclined towards progressive ideas, the key words were first indivisible because the Civil War had preserved the one federal union over the states' rights claims of slaveholding states, and second, liberty and justice for all an egalitarian affirmation of the rights of the poor as well as the rich. In 1919, Washington state became the first state to require Bellamy's Pledge of Allegiance in public schools. By the 1950s, reciting Bellamy's pledge had become a morning ritual in most American public schools with the pledge to my flag replaced officially by Congress in 1942 to the flag of the United States of America. But for that tiny change, Bellamy's pledge remained as he wrote it until the 1950s, when God was put into the pledge. As the Cold War developed, religion and God were publicly embraced. President Eisenhower initiated breakfasts in the White House, a prayer breakfast in the White House, and Congress created a prayer room in the Capitol. In God We Trust was by law made the nation's official motto, replacing e pluribus unum, one out of many, which despite the Civil War had done fairly well for nearly 200 years as our motto. In God We Trust, placed on some currency in, during the Civil War, was engraved on all American money in the 1950s. 
In such a Cold War political environment, the Catholic fraternity or fraternal organization, the Knights of Columbus, well aware of the historical linkage of Bellamy's Pledge of Allegiance to Columbus Day, proposed in 1951 during the Korean War to add the words under God between the words nation and indivisible in the pledge. In part because it was being pushed by Catholics, such a bill introduced in Congress in 1953 had little support. Nobody was going to back a Catholic-pushed legislation, and was even publicly opposed by Francis Bellamy's son. But in February 1954, one sermon delivered before one important parishioner married American patriotism to godliness. That month, George McPherson Doherty, the pastor of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., which President Eisenhower attended, delivered a sermon with the president sitting in front of him. In it, Doherty lamented that the Pledge of Allegiance could be the pledge of any country and that it needed under God added to it. And this is what he said. I can hear little Muscovites recite a similar pledge to their hammer and sickle flag. The Soviets claimed to be an indivisible republic too, he pointed out. The Cold War, Doherty insisted, was not about political beliefs. Quote, Thomas Jefferson's political democracy over against Lenin's communistic state. Or it was not about, and the Cold War is not about economic systems, Doherty preached. Quote, between, shall we say, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations and Karl Marx's Das Kapital. Rather, he went on, it is a theological war. Judeo-Christian civilization in mortal combat against modern, secularized, godless society, which the Soviet Union represented. From the root of, he went on, from the root of atheism stems the evil weed of communism and its branches of materialism and political dictatorship, end of quote. Doherty's sermon ended with a ringing call for Eisenhower, who was sitting in front of him, to help in the legislative effort to add under God to the pledge. Eisenhower did, and the legislation, which had been stalled by June 1954, four months later, the law changing the, the pledge, putting God into it, had passed Congress and was signed by the president. When he signed the legislation on June 14, 1954, Flag Day, Eisenhower said he was pleased that from, quote, that day on, millions of our school children will daily proclaim in every city and town the dedication of our nation <clears throat> and our people to the Almighty. To anyone who truly loves America, nothing can be more inspiring than to contemplate this rededication of our youth on each school morning to our country's true meaning. For nearly 50 years after 1954, God comfortably sat in the Pledge of Allegiance until the year 2000 and the historical intervention of one man named Michael Newdow. Spelled, by the way, exactly the way it sounds, N-E-W-D-O-W, -W, who grew up in Bronx, New York, and Teaneck, New Jersey, a graduate of Brown University, UCLA Medical School, and the University of Michigan Law School. Newdow, who practiced law and also worked in an emergency, as an emergency room physician in Sacramento, California, filed a federal lawsuit in March 2000 he claimed that the teacher-led daily recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance with the phrase, One Nation Under God, harmed his daughter, a student in the Elk Grove, California Elementary School. He argued that the state-run ritual proclaimed the existence of God and was thus an unconstitutional violation of the First Amendment's prohibition of an establishment of religion, which courts have regularly interpreted to mean a prohibition of state sponsorship or endorsement of religion. Newdow and the mother of his daughter had never married and were not living together. 
The girl's mother described herself as a born-again born Christian. Nudow was himself a Jewish atheist. At the time of the suit, the child's mother had sole custody of the daughter. The district court dismissed Nudow's case in 2001. He then appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which sits in San Francisco. In June 2002, to the nation's amazement, a panel of the appeals court ruled two to one that it was indeed an unconstitutional sponsorship of religion, a violation of the First Amendment for public schools in Elk Grove to ask students to recite under God as part of the Pledge of Allegiance. No sooner had the ruling been publicized than every politician in America raced to appear on television to denounce it. President Bush said the decision was ridiculous and that it reinforced his resolve to appoint, quote, common sense judges who understand that our rights are derived from God. Senator Kerry, soon to be the Democratic candidate for president, said that, quote, holding under God and the pledge unconstitutional was half-assed justice, the most absurd thing. That's not the establishment of religion. Robert Byrd, Democrat of West Virginia, an elder statesman of the Senate fumed that the decision came from a stupid judge and an atheist lawyer. America, he warned, should not be ruled by a bunch of atheists. Almost immediately, the Elk Grove School Board, supported by the Bush administration, took the case to the United States Supreme Court. Judge Alfred Goodwin, who had written the decision for the two to one panel, was a Republican appointed to the Ninth Circuit Court in 1971 by President Nixon and was known to his friends as Tex. The very next day, he postponed any implementation of his ruling until the Supreme Court ruled. The United States Senate quickly passed legislation reaffirming the words under God by a vote of 99 to 0, and the House did the same by a vote of 416 to 3. Judge Goodwin's ruling, joined by Judge Stephen Reinhardt, was eclipsed by the ensuing political firestorm. It strongly sided with Nudo, who had argued his own case that the words under God had a religious, not a secular purpose. To say the United States, Goodwin wrote, it, quote, is a nation under God, is a profession of a religious belief, namely a belief in monotheism, and therefore was an unconstitutional government endorsement of religion. The dissenting vote, remember it was two to one, Ferdinand Fernandez, appointed to the circuit court by George H.W. Bush, offered what he described as judicial good sense, a worrisome warning that to rule against God and the Pledge of Allegiance allowed atheists like Newdow to put America on the slippery slope that would end by evicting religion from the American way of life and the triumph of irreligion itself. When the appeal reached the Supreme Court on March 21, 2004, lawyer Newdow argued his own case. The justices, however, never ruled on Newdow's claim that under God was an unconstitutional establishment of religion. On June 14th, wonderfully symbolic flag day again, exactly 50 years to the June 14th, 2004, exactly 50 years to the day after President Eisenhower had signed the legislation putting God into the pledge, the, the Supreme Court preserves God's place in it, but not with booming legal arguments, but with whimpering procedural sidesteps. Justice John Paul Stevens held for a unanimous court that Newdow had no standing when he brought the original case against the Elk Grove School, which the Ninth Circuit Court had decided in his, in his favor. Because the Supreme Court held, he was a non-custodial parent. He was never married to his daughter's mother, who had custody of the child, 
and who, according to her lawyer, was giving her daughter a religious upbringing and wants her to say the pledge with under God. So the court sidestepped the decision and God remained in the court. God was safely still in the pledge. But the indefatigable atheist Nudow was not silenced. In September 2005, he brought a new case on behalf of himself and three other unnamed parents and their children in nearby Rio Linda Union School District to the same California District Court he had tried in 2000. The District Court judge in January 2006 again ruled in Newdow's favor, holding that the pledges under God clause violated the First Amendment. He too stayed the carrying out of his ruling pending appeals by the Rio Linda School Board. The case was indeed appealed this time to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, again, with arguments heard on December 4, 2007. It took over two years until March 2010 for the Ninth Circuit Court panel to decide the Rio Linda case. Exactly 10 years after Newdow brought his first an ill-fated suit on behalf of his daughter, the Ninth Circuit Court panel finally and definitively resolved the legal status of the phrase under God in the pledge by holding two to one that the two words were not state sponsorship of religion, thus overturning the 2006 ruling of the district court judge. This court's 58-page ruling was written by Carlos T. Bea, B-E-A, a 2003 George Bush appointee. He was joined in the majority by Justice Dorothy Nelson, who was appointed to the appeals court by President Carter. The pledge, Bea wrote, quote, was of allegiance to our republic, not of allegiance to God or to any religion. Congress's purpose in 1954 in adding God, he said, was patriotic, not religious, he argued. Which, by the way, when you read the congressional statements of 1954 is utterly uh, untrue. Bayer held that adding the words had a secular political purpose and did not endorse, favor, or promote religion, did not endorse one religion over another, nor did it coerce students into participating in a religious exercise. Bayer held that under God in the pledge had no religious significance, but was merely a secular political statement. It is not a prayer, but patriotism. It was added to the pledge in 1954, he argues, to make the political point that America has a limited government, unlike the Soviets' all-powerful government, that provided for and dominated the people. It represented, he wrote, the American political belief that government is not supreme, but that a power greater than government, God gave the American people their rights. Students reciting one nation under God are thus referring to the historical traditions of America, not making a personal affirmation through prayer or invocation that the speaker believes in God or that God exists, he wrote. The court went on to argue that citing God in the pledge is merely rhetorical and stylistic. Mentioning God merely gives, quote, a note of importance which a pledge to our nation ought to have and which ceremonial references to God invoke in our culture. References to God simply add a solemn and inspiring note to pledging loyalty to the flag. Under God, in the pledge then, the court concluded in 2010, is unrelated to religious belief. It has the predominant purpose and effect, and I quote, of only adding a solemn and inspiring note to what should be a solemn and inspiring promise, a promise of allegiance to the republic. End of quote. 
To all of this, the dissenting circuit court justice responded, quote, pure poppycock. <laughs> Stephen Reinhardt, who had sided with Goodwin in the original Newdow case heard by the Ninth Circuit, wrote the dissent in Rio Linda. Appointed to the court by President Carter, he wrote that no one, quote, familiar with the history of the pledge could in good conscience agree with Bayer and Nelson's absurd finding that under God was inserted into the pledge for any purpose other than an explicitly and predominantly religious one. Reinhardt argued that the two words were in fact added in 1954, quote, for the purpose of indoctrinating school children with a religious belief that God exists. The Ninth Circuit majority ruling saw it otherwise. Under God in the pledge was not an unconstitutional endorsement of religion because the reference to God is understood to be religiously meaningless. Stripped of spiritual significance, God is secularized and performs political, patriotic, and rhetorical service. Citing God has nothing to do with religion, it holds. No surprise, then, that many religious figures, while approving of the majority ruling, were just as critical of Bayer's argument about the pledge's lack of religious content, his relegation of God to a non-religious term, as were Newdow and Reinhardt. Father Richard John Newhouse, the respected founder of the religious journal First Things, announced that, quote, most Americans agree with Mr. Newdow that a reference to God is a reference to God, the government's brief notwithstanding. Have we come to the point, he asks, quote, when references to God in public are permissible because nobody really believes what they say? On the contrary, he writes, the phrase under God recognizes the guidance of God in our national affairs, he insisted. Those like Justice Bayer, for whom the post-54 pledge has a political, predominantly patriotic purpose, and those like Newdow, Justice Reinhardt, and Father Newhouse, for whom it has an indisputably religious purpose, are all correct. They are both camps are correct. What the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals did in 2010 was codify and legitimize the intimate linkage of Americanism and religiosity, which had been a drumbeat during the Cold War. Changing the pledge in 1954 was an establishment and sponsorship of religion because it married religion to citizenship. Being religious, Believing in God is declared in the pledge to be central to what it means to be an American and becomes a litmus test for citizenship. It is the creedal core of an American civil religion, a merging of the political and the spiritual. The court is saying that to be an American, one must be a believer. Affirming a religious identity is taken as the sign of being a good American. Now, studies show that large majorities of Americans assume that all good Americans have some sort of spiritual life, and that to be irreligious, to be a non-believer, is to be un-American. Referring to efforts to remove under God from the pledge, a 2010 roadside Pennsylvania billboard depicted a young child pledging allegiance to the flag with the printed message, why do atheists hate America? Another, in West, another billboard in West Virginia reads, anti-God is anti-American. If as many scholars contend, communities achieve solidarity and identity only when they imagine an other who does not share the values of those legitimately within the community, then in America, the non-believer is the other, unworthy of citizenship. Now, as many of you know, reciting the Pledge of Allegiance 
is the last ritualized act in the naturalization ceremony for new citizens, which makes clear that affirming loyalty to America requires asserting a belief in God, even if God is so allied with the United States that the courts could see God as secular. I repeat, it signifies that what defines an American is being a believer, and that non-believers are unwelcome in the American political community. Newdow's decade-long atheist crusade against God and the Pledge of Allegiance had produced by 2010 an unintended outcome. The judicial doctrine of civil religion, the assumption that one has to be religious, i.e. believe in God, to be a good American. This linkage is assumed in the courts even as paradoxically they insist they are not affirming or establishing religion, and even more paradoxically, as the number of self-proclaimed non-believing Americans grows dramatically. We have to end this story of the Pledge of Allegiance with some comic relief, if one could. The late iconoclastic comedian Robin Williams like millions of non-believers, remained unpersuaded about America's dependence on divine guidance. If he could, he always told his audiences, he would yet again rewrite the Pledge of Allegiance. This time, with less attention to religion and more to geography. And he offered a new Pledge of Allegiance, with which I will conclude. What was his new Pledge of Allegiance? Quote, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under Canada and above Mexico, <laughs> indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay.